All right, everybody, just take a breath. The Reds got that first win out of the way for the second half of the season. It was a great win. They kind of put everything together, looked good doing it, too. We're going to talk about that on today's podcast. Plus, we've got some Jonathan India appreciation to appreciate. And we got some news and notes to get to. And I've got a locked on Reds line question packed podcast for you here today. Before we jump into all that, though, Let's roll that graphic. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, Reds fans and baseball fans alike? Thanks for finding the Locked On Reds podcast today. I'm your host, Jeff Carr, super fan and addict of the Cincinnati Reds, and I've turned that addiction into information for you on today's podcast. We're going to talk about that Reds win and a lot more. Before we get into that, though, I want to make sure you're following the podcast right here on this YouTube channel or on the podcasting app you're currently listening to you can also follow me on twitter at jeff Carr with three f's and follow the show at locked on reds and save that locked on reds line number into your phone at 513-549-0159 i got a question i'm getting to later on in today's show also another shout out i mentioned it yesterday but next monday july 26th myself Stephen offenbaker and mo egger will be at fretboard brewery in blue ash for a live Reds crossover podcast between the Lockdown Reds and Reds Alert podcast. You're not going to miss that. Check that out. It's at Fretboard Brewery in Blue Ash next Monday night, July 26th at 7 p.m. Hope to see everybody out there. All right, enough of the housekeeping stuff. Let's talk about this win. Wade Miley pitched a good outing. He deserved that standing ovation that he got. Really thought that he could have went seven. He just kind of ran into some problems going to – full counts and walking guys there in the seventh inning. So David Bell felt compelled to bring him out after he got that strikeout. Eight strikeouts for Wade Miley, though. A little bit of an uncharacteristic game. There was some hard contact made by the Mets hitters. Not something that he gives up a lot. In fact, we've raved about his ability to limit hard contact this season. The Mets actually got some hard hits off of his pitches this time. And he doesn't really get those high strikeout totals, but he had them working last night. He didn't have too many clean innings. In fact, there was only one clean inning in his six and a third, but he was able to pitch out of whatever trouble he got into. The only time that he kind of got beat was whenever Pete Alonzo hit a home run and Pete Alonzo does that to people. I mean, we saw what he did in the home run derby. It's two games now in Grand American ballpark and two home runs for the uh, two time home run derby champion. So if you're surprised, I don't know what to tell you. The nice thing is though, he got some help on the batting side by homers. Jonathan India led off the bottom of the first for the Reds with a home run, his first ever leadoff home run. We're going to talk a lot more about Jonathan Indy in the next segment, but that was a phenomenal blast. Then Joseph Daniel Votto really laid into one, hit it to right center, and then the Punisher, one pitch later, follows it back to back. I I was standing there over in the bow tie bar with Stephen Offenbaker and just said, hey, yeah, how cool it would be if the Punisher went back to Joey. Lo and behold, he did. Love it. I love I love the flex. I, if you see that every game, it just makes that game better. And then the bullpen was able to hold it. They got a couple of insurance runs to help out, and it was just enough to get that win. Amir Garrett with a very nice ninth, and I've always said that every time he comes into the game, you can tell how his outing is going to go by his first two pitches. If he doesn't throw a strike in his first two pitches, look out. But I was wrong last night because he walked the first guy he saw on four pitches, and then he got the rest of the guys. No problem whatsoever. Everybody was just cool, calm, and collective, although I'm pretty sure in the stadium he was not happy because he was getting booed after that four-pitch walk. And so after the save, he was probably like, well, everybody booing me. How are we feeling now? But at the end of the day, the Reds get that win, and they get that save. It's nice to see 
because when we talk about a close game late, whether it's pretty much within three runs, we're all sweating bullets because this bullpen has just been rough. I've got a question on the Lockdown Reds line that we're going to address a bullpen thing later on in today's episode. But overall, a nice, good win. Plus, on my side of things, uh, it gets me off the schneid. I, I've been to like five straight losses, and two of those were rain-delayed games. But it was nice. I, I could exhale. You know, now we're good. Now we can settle into a win streak, if you will. Be down at the ballpark again today looking for another win to close out this Mets series with a series win. Hopefully that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow. Also wanted to give a shout out tomorrow on the podcast. We will have Lucas Smith from the locked on Cardinals podcast for a little bit of a crossover ahead of reds and Cardinals this weekend, but it's just a great game. Overall, Wade Miley is done pretty much exactly what we've expected him to all year long. And that's be the consistent force in the starting rotation. Now, don't get me wrong. We didn't expect him to be this good at it, but I always expected him to be the guy that you could expect to come into the game and give you that performance that, you know, eat night in, night out. You know what you're getting from Wade Miley. And he's been that way this year. It's just been really, really good. Happy to see what he's brought to the table. All right. Speaking of being brought to the table, coming up, we have got some appreciation to hand out to Jonathan India. There's still a little bit of time left in this season, so he's got plenty of room for playing and stuff, but he has been phenomenal, and it has to be put into context. We're going to do that here in just a moment. Before we do, though, I got to tell you about this salmon that I just made. I'm talking about miso maple glazed salmon absolutely brilliant. We're talking about some sockeye salmon from the wild Alaskan company. So tasty. You get it from wild Alaskan right at your door. It's flash frozen. They catch it in the wild. They fillet it, they clean it and they flash freeze it and send it right to you. So it is basically as if you just caught it out of some kind of stream in your backyard. And it's so tasty. They got great recipes. This maple miso glazed salmon was one of their recipes on their blog that you can check out at their website, wildalaskan.com. And it was just absolutely so tasty. And their whole deal is to make sure that they catch stuff fresh from the wild so that you know you are getting the best food possible because each shipment contains premium, wild-caught, individually-wrapped portions of delicious seafood that's ready to prepare and easy to cook. I'm talking about 15 minutes. This recipe was ready. We're not talking about some long drawn out process, maple miso glazed salmon. And it was so good paired it with a nice white wine, a little bit of rice. Yeah. Good stuff. Anyway, sounded bougie, but right now we're talking about the wild Alaskan company and you can get $15 off your first box of premium seafood. When you visit wild Alaskan company, dot com slash MLB. That's the wild Alaskan company dot com slash MLB for $15 off your first box. I'm talking about salmon, halibut, cod. They've got amazing smoked salmon fillets. They've got great seasonal rotational items. They get some crab meat in, they get some lobster meat in. You got to check them out at wild Alaskan company dot com slash MLB and make sure you use our URL to let them know that we sent you. All right, so let's appreciate Jonathan India because he has been absolutely phenomenal out of the leadoff spot. Now, 180 plate appearances, batting first, and his slash line is amazing. 298 batting average, 447 on base percentage, and he's slugging 454. I, I, that is phenomenal. 901 OPS. You have to go back to Shinsu Chu in 2013 to find anything comparable, which it was slightly better. The numbers were a little bit higher, but Jonathan India has been a revelation as a rookie at a leadoff spot that, that home run yesterday. And he got another walk. What, what I say yesterday, he falls out of bed and he's on first base. He gets on base. So well, he got another walk yesterday. He absolutely 
gets the leadoff spot. And this is just his first year doing it. And when we say this, I, I everybody agrees because if you're sitting there and you don't think that Jonathan India is good, then you're not watching Reds baseball because he is phenomenal. But to put it into context, I was looking at the Reds composite leadoff statistics over the last couple of years. Just for example, 2020, last year, the slash line of all hitters who hit leadoff was 215 with a 313 on base and a 320 slugging for a 633 OPS. Almost a 300 point increase improvement to Jonathan India this year. And we're talking about a guy who really wasn't even on the radar this spring training. Just phenomenal the way that this dude has gone. I mean, you can go back 2018 or 2019. They hit 253 with a 329 OP on base and a 438 slugging. So okay, but 767 OPS. You can go back and you can see all the different ones. And and there's been some hodgepodge. I mean, I know you we just talked about 2018 or I'm looking at 2018 right now, 254, 326, 396. The guy who hit leadoff mostly that season is currently playing for the Mets off the bench, Jose Peraza. We're talking about guys like back in 2017, 243 batting average, 295 on base percentage, and a 340 slugging. Bet you could probably guess who that was. That was the human superhero himself, Billy Hamilton. Just didn't really get on base. But the idea that Jonathan India is so good needs that context. We're talking about the best, and I know it's only 180 play appearances. He's still got more to go, but we're talking about the best leadoff hitter in eight years since 2013 and probably the second best leadoff hitter in the last like 15 or 20 years. There have been some guys hit leadoff for this team. I was looking back through, you can go back to 2015, which I know that was kind of a lost year. There's a bunch of lost years in there, but you go back to 2015, one of the guys who had significant, like we're talking about the same kind of plate appearances that Jonathan India is getting right now. And whenever I read this guy's name, I butchered the name. So somebody's going to correct me on this, but Jason Borgios. Yeah. Remember him? Ken Huber does score X reds. He, he knows what I'm talking about, but Jason Borgios hit a bunch of leadoff spot. He was terrible hitting on the leadoff spot. Jonathan India has just absolutely set the table so wonderfully. I mean, his season on base percentage is now above 400. That's compiling all of his at bats, not just the leadoff ones, but when he comes to the plate, he has a swagger. He has a confidence. He steps into that batter's box and he knows that he's getting on first, whether he's getting hit by a pitch, he's getting a walk or he's getting a hit. You can see that confidence in his eyes. It's not, he's not going up there trying to press. He is comfortable. He makes a nice, comfortable swing to get there. And I love watching Jonathan India play. He is absolutely the kind of guy that we were hoping we were going to get out of Nick Senzel, and injuries have been a huge problem with that, and we'll talk about him in a little bit, but I still love what India has brought to the table, and to think that the only way that we were ever talking about Jonathan India over the last couple of years was to say, hey, we should trade him for this guy, or we should trade him for that guy. The Reds should offer him to the Astros for Dallas Keuchel, or you know, something like that. So glad that didn't happen. So glad that that never came to fruition because he has been phenomenal and the Reds have him for many, many years. Hopefully we'll uh, see him a lot out of the leadoff spot, but Jonathan India has been the guy that the Reds have really needed this season because especially when you look back through the last, and I only went through the last eight years. If we go back the last 20 years, I guarantee he's the second best leadoff hitter they've ever had next to Shin Su Chu. Guarantee it. Might have to test that theory one day. Not right now, though, because we've got some news and notes and a Locked On Reds line question coming up. Before we get into that, though, I want you to get into a Built Bar. Crack open that beautifully tasting 100% real chocolate protein bar. It is the best tasting protein bar on the market, bar none, because it's not like you're eating a thing of cardboard, chunk of cardboard with no taste. You've got 100% real chocolate with cherry bar, sea, coconut, peanut butter, brownie, all these amazing flavors. And the stats are amazing on them. Four grams or less net carbs, four grams or less 
sugar and up to 18 grams of protein. And we're talking about like 120, 130 calories. That is way better than some of those 100 calorie snack packs that people put themselves through check out built bar today go to builtbar.com and enter the promo code locked 15 to save 15 percent off your next order built bar has the most amazing protein bar on the market i've been telling you about them for a while i can't keep them in my house because they're so awesome and you'll love them too go to builtbar.com and use the promo code locked 15 to save 15 percent off your next order also, today's podcast is brought to you in part by Fully Loaded Chew. Fully Loaded Chew is tobacco-free, long cut in pouches that give you the same feel and buzz that you're used to, but they do it without tobacco. It's available in nine flavors, and Fully Loaded Chew is made with all food-grade ingredients and tobacco-free nicotine, which is the purest form of nicotine available. When you're talking about nicotine pouches and things like that, Fully Loaded Chew is the only moist nicotine pouch on the market. All other nicotine pouches are dry, white pouches. Nothing feels or packs that buzz like a Fully Loaded Chew. Fully Loaded Chew is offering my listeners today a special offer. Right now, you can try it for just a dollar. That's right, one dollar total. Go to www.fullyloadedchew.com and use the promo code Locked On for just one dollar. And free shipping if you use the promo code locked on at checkout. The next time you go for a dip, make it fully loaded chew at fully loaded chew.com. All right. So there are some news and notes. There were some updates yesterday in David Bell's pregame interview. He was talking about some dudes who are starting rehab assignments next week, which is exciting to hear because we've got Lucas Sims, Nick Senzel, and Alex Blandino all getting started on rehab assignments next week. It'll be awesome to have them back because Sinzel will be able to play multiple positions. We've been hearing a lot about him possibly playing some shortstop, which will be good. Alex Blandino can play some shortstop, and both of them will be able to kind of push a Eugenio Suarez a little bit. Maybe we see Suarez's playing time get cut down because we're kind of to that point where Suarez is what he is. It's going to take like 10 or 15 game hitting streak or something like that for him to really get back to the Suarez that we all know and love. So with that in mind, the Reds have to be realistic about it. And with Senzel coming back, they also said that Mike Mostakis has been taking grounders and he's been making significant improvement toward returning. When he comes back, there's going to be a great chance to really have a solid lineup that you don't have to slot a Eugenio Suarez in there every single day. And I would love to see David Bell be realistic about that. And I think he can be. I, I really do think that David Bell has a good idea of how to set this team up to win. And I think he's going to do that whenever these guys come back healthy. But you have those three guys going out on rehab. You also have TJ Antone will begin throwing bullpen sessions next week, which is a key step into getting to a rehab assignment. And he mentioned Michael Feliz is restarting his rehab assignment. He had a setback with his elbow injury. It'll be interesting to see and shout out to the morning spin and Reds content plus for kind of pointing this out. If he has trouble getting back healthy, is Michael Feliz better than some of these guys in the bullpen? Sure. But he doesn't really move the needle. He kind of flicks the needle a little bit, but he, he doesn't really move it. So he's not really a guy that you're looking at as being like, oh, man, when they get Michael Feliz back. So if he has trouble getting back healthy, he could be a possible DFA candidate. And then they open up a roster spot for somebody. But anyway, those guys are coming back on, uh, you know, we got good injury updates about them. It was it was in, uh, you know, Encouraging to see the fact that David Bell was able to give us those updates because getting Senzel back and Blandino back is going to be good, especially Blandino for the fact that Blandino is a much better bench option than Mike Freeman. Yeah, we, we forgot to mention that the other day. Uh, the Sunday game against the Brewers that they ended up losing badly to Corbin Burns, that snapped the undefeated streak of the Reds starting Mike Freeman and winning. So there's no longer even that little funny storyline to have with Mike Freeman. He's got a weighted runs created plus of 38. 100 is league average. It's not good. So 
yeah, it's time to move on. Landino will help them do that. And it'd be good to see Lucas Sims back as well for this bullpen because if if we can see more, because the last two appearances, so Amir Garrett's been doing this thing. We'll talk about him briefly just for a moment because I also want to talk about him in the Locked On Reds line question that I have. But he's been doing this thing where it's like two bad appearances or three bad appearances and then two or three really good appearances. His last two appearances have been good. He had that four pitch walk to kind of scare everybody on Tuesday night, but he got a save with two strikeouts and a weak pop fly that the Mets never had a shot. And then his appearance before that was a perfect inning against the Mets in the first game of the series. So if you can get more good appearances, more, more good, more better, whatever. If, if Amir Gair can be better like that more consistently, and then you add back Lucas Sims and TJ Antone to this mix, then we're talking about at least a serviceable bullpen. And, and along with Heath Hembry as well, you got to continue to keep him in the conversation. Dude just strikes people out. I, I love Heath Hembry. I, I, he has been the one guy that I think that we all kind of figured out of these different waiver fines and minimum deals and things that they made, there's going to be one or two that hit. He is one that has. He has been a good relief pitcher that, yeah, sure, you can be frustrating sometimes, but relief pitchers do that. I mean, Eric Gagne blew a save, and he's got the record for the most uh, without blowing a save, but he blew a couple saves in his career. It happens, and it happens to the best of them too. But I've been encouraged to see that, and with these guys coming back, that's going to be huge. I also noted um, there was an article that came out Earlier today, Ken Rosenthal kind of had a look around the league news and notes, and he started it off by saying the Reds really missed an opportunity with Willie Adamas. And I think we all know that because, you know, C. Trent had talked about the Reds possibly going after Willie Adamas. Ken Rosenthal confirmed through multiple unnamed MLB sources that the Reds contacted the Rays but there was never really any traction on a deal. They never really got to the point where the Reds and Rays might have made a deal for Willie Adamas. And sure, what the Brewers gave up were two young, exciting relievers who, if you heard Jake, uh, Jake Mastriani talk about in the preseason, he was really excited about J.P. Fireson and Drew Rasmussen, but they sent those two guys for Willie Adamas. The Reds didn't have two really good relievers to send to them, but maybe they could have put together a package for a dude who makes less than a million dollars a year and is under three years of team control. That would have been a guy that should have been in the Reds wheelhouse and they weren't ever really in on it. There was a note there too, that Ken Rosenthal had that said something, and this will be a bigger topic later on, not something that I'm going to expound on in today's episode, but he mentioned that if the Reds get to a point where they don't feel like they're in this, they should start trading off everybody. And he even specifically named Luis Castillo. I don't agree with that at all. There's a lot of reasons why number one, I subjectively, I don't agree with rebuilding because I want to see the reds win, but also, all right, we'll, we'll do this real quick. Also the same people who were in charge of the rebuild last time that failed would be in charge of this rebuild. So whenever everyone's kind of going rebuild crazy on Twitter and you see people on social media, it's like, blow it up, get rid of everybody, start over. How'd that work last time? Yeah, not so great. So I'm not really apt to see, I'm not, I'm not really excited to see anything like that. And uh, hopefully we don't have to talk about that in the coming days. But it's just interesting to note that Ken Rosenthal was able to kind of confirm that the Reds weren't really ever in on Willie Adamas, even though they totally should have been. And they have been killed by Adamas since he's come up because he said in the 15 games, the stats are in the 15 games that Willie Adamas has played against the Reds since being traded to Milwaukee, he has a slugging of 696. I mean, we already knew that Willie Adamas killed the Reds, but seeing the numbers like that are sobering. And one more thing, one uh, before we leave today's podcast, I had a question on the Lockdown Reds line that I found interesting. This is from Jake in Cincy. Shout out to Jake. Appreciate the question. He said, he said without going into an, an explanation of each, which I might end up doing anyway, but without going into an explanation of each, how would you rank your trust level of the current Reds? relievers. 
this is sobering because there's not anybody that I implicitly trust. Probably the closest is Heath Hembry. Uh, I mentioned that I think he is the bullpen pitcher of the season so far for them. But Jake also notes to include TJ Antone, Lucas Sims, and Michael Lorenzen. So definitely one, two, TJ Antone, Lucas Sims. I'm going to say number three is Heath Hembry. I really like what he's brought to the table, and I think he is their third best reliever. I kind of put Amir Garrett and Michael Lorenz in four or five. I still think that Amir has plenty of talent to show. He's just been so inconsistent with it, and there's been some games that he comes in, and immediately the score changes, and the Reds lose the lead or something like that. But there's also been those games where he comes in and strikes out the side. So which Amir do you get is it goes a long way. That's why I rank him fourth. Michael Lorenzen, I just cannot rank him super high right now because we don't know what we're going to get out of him. We've only seen one inning pitched, and then he messed up his hamstring. Who knows how long he's going to be out with that? So it's going to be hard for me to say that he's in the upper echelon of trust, even though he's hurt. But that still means that he's a lot better than some of the other options because you take guys like Sean Doolittle, um, honestly, Brad Brock, probably number six, he's had some pretty bad outings where he gives up lots of hard contact, but he's also had those clutch performances where he gets the reds out of a jam. He's just, he's kind of in the same vein of Amir Garrett that he's super inconsistent. So I put him number six, uh, Sean Doolittle, um, Sino Perez, um, Ashton Goudeau, all of those guys are in a category that I like to call unranked because I don't think it makes any sense to give them rankings. They are just guys that when I hear their names, I hope it's because the Reds are up by a bunch or they're pretty much out of the game. Basically, situations where they're not going to affect the outcome of the game super much. I don't want to see Sean Doolittle in a high leverage situation again this season. We saw him blow that extra innings game the other day. I just, I have no desire to see what else he has left in the tank because I don't think there's much left and I don't think it's going to help the Reds, but that's kind of how I look at it. So just to recap, Antone, Sims, Hembry, then I have Amir, uh, Heath, or no, I already said Heath Hembry, Michael Lorenzen, Brad Brock, and then just a gaggle of whatever else because that's kind of how this Reds bullpen has been. But that's going to do it for us here today. Thanks again to Jake for that question on the Locked On Reds line, and thank you for watching and listening to the Locked On Reds podcast. Make sure you follow the podcast right here on YouTube or on your favorite podcasting app. You can also follow me on Twitter at Jeff Carr with three Fs and follow the show at Locked On Reds and save the Locked On Reds line number into your phone at 513-549-0100. Five nine. Thanks again for listening to today's Locked On Reds podcast, which is brought to you by Spotify Green Room. Download the Spotify Green Room app now on your iOS or Android device, and you can join me tomorrow for a little off day chat about the Cincinnati Reds team. That's the Spotify Green Room app. They're changing the way that we talk sports, and I'll talk to each and every one of you tomorrow.